So, and the technique is, and I think it, this is kind of difficult to emphasize enough, especially in the first two semesters of uh, physics, is dimensional analysis. So when you go back and like look at the old physics lectures, you might feel like uh, your physics instructors are overemphasizing units. Uh, and that, uh, I understand that perception. And I would blame that perception on the fact that you haven't seen how powerful a technique dimensional analysis can be. So dimensional, you know, looking at units, it's not all that powerful when you feel like you know all the physics there is to know. You simply calculate the numbers, you're done. You drive the formula, you're done. You don't need to look at the units. Looking at the units becomes useful when you actually don't know that much physics. Here, this strong interaction, I know nothing about it. There's no formula that tells me what it is. Somebody guessed this, so I have this characteristic length, but beyond that, I know, still know nothing about it. I don't, I don't know, is there a charge, is there? But what I can do is I can guess a mass scale that's associated with this length scale. And I can make that association um, based on a, the dimensional analysis technique. So let me, um, it won't take long, so let me just uh, sketch out the consideration we are going through and let's just do the dimensional analysis and kind of come up with some formula for this mass. So, all right, so for this dimensional analysis, the starting place is this. I have this length scale, um, or uh, how do I put it? Sorry, um, so the quantity I'm trying to figure out is the mass of this meson, one of the properties of this meson. So, uh, sorry, I guess? Uh, I haven't explained, <laughs> sorry, I introduced a new word without defining it. For now, let me call this Yukawa's particle. Um, so I have this new particle, and I want to know the mass of the particle. So all right, I have this mass. And the very first step in dimensional analysis is first guessing what parameters might go into determining this mass. So let me give you a starting point. One of the parameters I think needs to go into determining this is the characteristic length, right? I mean, that's a, gotta be one of the inputs. But if I just end here, then I'm kind of screwed because length is not mass. Uh, so, um, so I need some additional parameters that's going to help make me sense of things here. Any guesses for additional parameters? Physical constants. What physical constants do you think should matter here? Now, electric constant probably one because whatever this is, it's not electromagnetic interaction. So if we are thinking of like epsilon naught, that's definitely not one of the parameters because it's not an electromagnetic interaction. The speed of light. Why speed of light? Because it's not electromagnetic. So there must be some other reason for speed of light to be important. Like special relativity. Yeah, is that what you're gonna say? I was just gonna say it's the speed of causality, so. Yeah, you know, I might be an audible here. I don't like the argument based on causality. I know there are physicists who argue based on causality. I don't necessarily believe in causality. So, but it, in the end, it's about speed. Of, it's about special relativity. And once you are dealing with the nuclear physics, energy scales are such that that relativity matters. Whenever relativity matters, speed of light. It's not as a. It's not the light that's important. It's that this is the universal speed limit. So whenever relativity becomes important, this plays a role, whether it's electromagnetic or not. All right, so that's one more parameter. Uh, I don't think that still helps me. This is a length, meters per second. I need some way to bring in kilogram, and neither of these have kilogram in it. Any other parameters? Physical constant that might play a role? Frequency? Frequency of what? It's not frequency. There, there's no fundamental constants that have unit of frequency. Well, that's just a different way of writing energy unit. What physical constants have you seen in this class? Once again, not electromagnetic. Yeah, Planck's constant. 
And in fact, so this is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. Whenever you have something that's quantum mechanical, it must involve a Planck's constant. <laughs> if it doesn't involve Planck's constant, then there must be some classical approximation of it. There is no classical approximation of nuclear interaction. So there has to be Planck's constant. I'm going to write down the reduced version just for fun. Um, I, I don't know if that will actually give me better numbers, but I'm just going to do that. So that's Planck's constant. And actually, this is probably a good chance for, you to, for me to mention um, these three fundamental constants that to involved in whatever happens to the universe. The three fundamental constants are these. Gravitational constant, speed of light, and Planck's constant. Um, there's, when you, so, and actually there are things you can do by combining these three fundamental constants. Those are called the Planck scale, and you can have fun with those, but we won't get to that today. Um, for today, so whatever this uh, Yukawa's particle is, it must involve the length scale, must involve relativity, must involve quantum mechanics. And let's see if that's enough to give us a unit of kilogram or unit of mass. So all right, let's see how they combine. So once you determine all the parameters that must go into determining this quantity, then what you have to do is now, how can I combine these in such a way to yield the correct unit? You can think of this as a way of elimin eliminating all the wrong answers. Because, like, why am I calling it that way? Like, how are you eliminating all the wrong answers when you combine them in a way to give you a correct unit? So this is how you have used dimensional analysis so far. You have calculated some algebraic answer on an exam or homework, and you are told to check units. Why are you checking units? Because if units is wrong, then it's absolutely wrong. Yeah, there's no way. If you know, one quantity on one side is meters per second, and the other quantity is hertz, then there's no way these two can be equal to each other. You must have made an algebra mistake somewhere, right? So this is the argument base behind this dimensional analysis. Whichever way of combining these quantities there are, if they are combined in such a way that it doesn't give me kilogram, then that particular combination simply cannot be right. So we rule that out, that particular combination. So by combining them into a form that will only give me correct unit, I'm pre-rolling out all the other algebraic combination of this that simply cannot be right. Now, if you do this correctly, there will be only one unique combination that will give you a correct unit. If there are too many parameters here, then you might have to deal with multiple possibilities. Here, I know what I'm doing, so I picked the exactly correct number of parameters to give me the exact correct one unique combination that will give me one unique expression for math. So let's try that. Um, so first thing I need to do is I need to write down the units of each of these. So the Planck's constant in SI unit, it comes in the units of joule times a second. Um, and joule is unit of energy, or if I write this all out, it's a kilogram times joule, it's a, a energy, so it's a, a meter square per second squared. The way I remember it is work done is force times distance. So Newton times a meter. Newton is mass times acceleration, or kilogram times meter per second squared. So kilogram times, so Newton times meter, so meter squared per second squared times a second. And let me um, write, that, write it down in a way most people who, are, who do dimensional analysis do. Uh, I don't want to be really tied to SI unit. Unit is uh, more fundamental than SI unit system, the unit of mass, length, and time. So I'm going to use the letters mass, length and time. So what this is, is unit of mass times length squared divided by time, or time raised to the power of minus one. Yep. I think the other two are easier. Um, speed of light, that's uh, uh, meters per second, or uh, let me color code it correctly, or length times time raised to the power of minus 1. And finally, 
the length scale, well, I guess it is length scale, so it must have unit of length. So these are the units. And this is the kind of hypothesis or working um, setup with the dimensional analysis. Your working guess or starting point is that whatever this uh, mass is, I want to be able to express it as an algebraic combination of these three quantities. Or h bar raised to power of alpha speed of light raised to power of beta, and the length of scale raised to power of gamma. Or if you choose to look at the simply the unit quantities, then what you are saying is, well, unit of the left-hand side mass is equal to the unit of this raised to power of alpha. Or, um, uh, am I using? Yeah. Or so this, m l squared times to minus one raised to power alpha times speed of light, length and inverse time raised to power of beta times length of scale l raised to power of gamma. And the unit on the left hand side is, um, I guess, to be explicitly to be explicit, uh, really what it is, mass raised to the power of one. So me, let me actually write it all out completely. It's m mass raised to the power of one, length raised to the power of zero, time raised to the power of zero. Yep. So I will tell you that there is a systematic way to figure out these powers alpha, beta, and gamma. You can kind of guess from here. When you expand this out, you'll be able to collect like terms, you know, mass raised to some power, uh, that's combination of alpha, beta, gamma, length raised to some power, that's combination of alpha, beta, gamma, time raised to some power, that's also combination of alpha, beta, gamma. And then you say, this raised to this power is equal to whatever that mass raised to that power is. And you can come up with a system, a system of equations, three equations in terms of three unknowns, and you can actually do this systematically. You can actually program a program to do this the way you do it in linear algebra. Um, all of that is a little bit too cumbersome for my taste. It takes way too much work for something that's just uh, easier to guess and check. So I'm going to do that instead. And I will tell you my method for guessing and checking. So. Um, um, this is what I see. H bar is special in that that's the only parameter that has quantity of mass in it. So if I get this power alpha wrong to, to get the correct power of n, I'm kind of done. There's nothing I can do to fix it. So I must get this alpha correct to get this correct power. So that means uh, there's nothing else alpha can be. Alpha must be 1. OK, so once I nail that down, then I use the other two constants to fix the rest of units. I must somehow cancel out this length and time in the remaining thing. And you know how you do this guess and check will depend on the setup you have. That's why I was first telling you that there is a systematic way. If you don't feel comfortable guessing and checking, you can just do the systematic way. Um, but the way I'm guessing and checking is I look at one parameter which is uh, in terms of one unit only, which means I don't really have to worry about the length unit. Whatever I come up with the length, just before this parameter, I can use this to fix my remainder of length unit. So really all I want to worry about right now with the C is the unit of time. I just want to make sure I cancel out unit of time. So as I look at that, what I see is, oh, so this beta must be minus one, so that the t to minus one gets canceled out here. All right, so this is minus 1. Now that doesn't give me correct length unit because I have L to the 2 my, uh, and then minus 1 from here. So I still have one power of L left. So I would use this lambda to fix that. So this uh, must be minus 1. 
So this uh, kind of guessing and checking is uh, a lot quicker than systematic method in most cases. So that's uh, what I'm doing. So we do this as a guide. What we would now guess is that this mass, uh, whatever mass of Yukas particle is, this is the only combination that gives you the correct unit. The mass must be a combination of h bar raised to power 1 divided by speed of light times this length scale. And this somehow must give you correct unit. So let's uh, correct the unit. So let's plug in the numbers and see what kind of number we get. The, um, uh, I'm going to have to. I think what I might be able to do so that you can still read the stuff. So I don't know. Can I just leave it blank? Uh, all right, I guess that's good enough. All right, so let's just plug in the numbers. H bar divided by speed of light times, OK, length of scale I have to enter, 10 to minus 14 meters. Let's see. Uh, Ufram Alpha is usually smart enough to offer me the all the correct units. Um, all right, it offers me kilogram. Kilogram gives me no sense of scale whatsoever. So I'm going to ignore that and move on to MeV units. So 39 times electron mass. OK, it's not giving me the number I want. OK. Um, so okay, I get 20 MeV. But I think this is actually enough to show you one thing. Um, so it's heavier than electron, right? Definitely heavier than electron. But um, it's, you know, like 40 times the mass of the electron. But it's lighter than proton. Proton is, you know, 2,000 times the mass of electron. So it's somewhere in between. And that's where the name meson comes from. It's called Yukawa's meson because it's the mid-weight particle. Its weight is in the middle between the baryons and the leptons. <laughs> so uh, now the 20 MeV, that's not really the correct number. So the number that Yukawa used <laughs> must have been 10 to minus 15 for the nuclear scale. Um, so let me just go back and fix that. And um, we'll just uh, have the correct number for the next part of the discussion. So. Um, so this is a kind of a prediction. Uh, you know, I'm obviously simplifying some things, but um, so like in Yukawa's actual paper, there'll be more justification beyond. But the the core of the argument is still the same: that uh, if you have a particular length scale, which would give you a short-range interaction, then the particle that can be associated with this length scale is um, is very likely to have this uh, level of mass scale. Um, so, and you can, yeah, 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 yeah. And you can kind of see one thing actually. So, if you have a long range interaction, like if this was infinity, then what would the mass of this particle, in mediator particle, be? Like imagine your length scale that I enter up here is very, very large, like one meters. Very, very small mass, right? Does that match what we know about the photon? Massless. Yeah. So the fact that photon is massless is uh, closely associated with the fact that electromagnetic force is a long range force, or it exactly behaves Coulomb's law, one of uh, the inverse square law. So anyway, so so this is anyways. So this was Yuka's prediction that if you have a particle that's mediating this short-range force, then the mass of the particle, just a rough guess, is going to be 200 MeV per c squared. So that's uh, one of the characteristics of Yukawa's meson, and it's a bona fide prediction because he's hypothesizing existence of a particle with a mass that doesn't match any of the known particles. 